13 and verse 11, you made known to me the path of light. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now we're talking about what it uh, means to walk in the path of God, his path of righteousness, and to have his protective shelter uh, come over us and envelop us, and to walk in the path of righteousness, what's right and just and fair. Um, in doing that, we've been walking through the Bible, uh, book by book, which is very difficult for me to condense a book into one sermon. Um, but I think there's great benefit in doing that because we, we begin to pick up these themes that otherwise I don't think we would pick up. Uh, this week we're in Esther, so if you have your Bibles, um, I encourage you to open up to the book of Esther. And we're going to kind of bounce around a little bit uh, throughout the book of Esther. I'll set the stage a little bit. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So Esther is living in the time of the exile. Uh, so the Babylonians have come in. Uh, 586, they came into Jerusalem and just annihilated it. Um, they wiped out Jerusalem. They burned the temple to the ground. Uh, there was a remnant of Israelites that went back 70 years later, and that's where we found the context for uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Esther is living in Persia, uh, so she's to the east, and uh, she lost both her mom and her dad. Uh, we don't really know what happened, but it's possible that, uh, but that they had died in the exile. And Mordecai, who is her cousin, takes her under his wing, and she becomes as a daughter to Mordecai. Um, the king uh, has the queen... Queen Vashti put to death, and uh, so he goes out, and he's seeking a new queen. So Esther is one of, the, uh, one of the women who goes and is paraded before the king, and so he selects Esther, which is pretty interesting, uh, given what happens next. So, of course, we know about this plot uh, to, uh, to kill the king, and then Mordecai uncovered that plot, and that was reported back to the king. Uh, and so it was recorded in, uh, in the book that the king kept all these records. Uh, that came in handy a little, little bit later. But when Esther became king, um, there was a man who was the right-hand man to the king named Haman. And Haman expected people to bow to him uh, whenever he passed by. Mordecai wouldn't bow to Haman because... He said, I don't bow to anybody except my God. Haman didn't like it. Haman hated it. And so Haman hated Mordecai. He plotted to kill Mordecai and humiliate him. Again, that plays out later. But Esther, who now is queen, finds out about a plot from Haman to have all the Jews killed. Every living, breathing Jew, both young and old, uh, was supposed to be killed, and Haman did this because one person, Mordecai, wouldn't bow to him. And we were talking in class this morning about willful moral decline. This isn't like Haman was, just got mad one day and was like, kill all the Jews. Uh, Haman was an evil, wicked, horrible person, and he worked hard to become that evil. It's not like he, he just was an arrogant person and pride got the best of him. Haman, by this point, had worked very hard to get to this point. And so, lest you feel sorry for him when he finally is exterminated, don't. He was a very evil, wicked, vile person. And he wanted every single Jew killed. Now, chapter 4, I'm going to pick up a little bit. Uh, before where Victor started to read. Uh, we'll back up to verse 4. Esther chapter 4 and verse 4. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs uh, came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to, to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. 
Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and to plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and all the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. Guess whose turn it was to go to the king? Mordecai couldn't do it. He was out. Esther. Esther was the only person who was in the position, literally in the world. She was the only person put in a position to approach the king and possibly persuade him, but it was more likely that she would be put to death. They took this very seriously. You didn't approach the king. You want to talk about being unapproachable? Right? That's unapproachable. You didn't ever go to the king, even if you were the queen. You didn't go to the king unless the king had invited you to come, and he extended the invitation. You didn't go to the king. You just didn't do it. It wasn't acceptable. It was against the law, and the penalty was death. It didn't matter who you were. That's where the story picks up in verse 12. And you can read along with me up on the screen. They told Mordecai what Esther had said, and then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. Was Mordecai using scare tactics? No, he was using truth. She was going to be exterminated regardless of whether she went to the king or not because she was a Jew. Every single Jew was to be exterminated. So he says, don't think that you yourself, because you're in the king's palace, you're going to escape more than anybody else. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. In other words, God will find a way to deliver the Jews. Some way, somehow. But you and your father's house will perish. If you think you're going to escape, if you think you're going to get out of it, by the way, do you think this was an easy thing for her to do? Not at all. She literally was risking her life. And there was a better chance than not that she was going to be exterminated if she went to the king and pled on behalf of the Jews. This wasn't, this wasn't like casual dinner talk. She knew that there was a good chance she was going to be executed when she approached the king. Mordecai says, if you choose not to do it, then God will find another way to deliver the Jews, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. And Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. And then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Can you imagine? I want you to imagine just for a moment. If Christians not only said this, but if they believed it. Isn't that the way that Christians lived in the first century? They were radical. They were radical Christians, and death did not matter. Death didn't matter. Their job was not self-preservation to keep themselves alive. Isn't that interesting that we have this phenomenon today where 
we try and work so hard to keep people alive as long as humanly possible. We try to defy death over and over and over again. We create nursing homes for people who are suffering, and that begs the question, are we doing an act of benevolence or are we prolonging suffering? Isn't that an interesting question about our nursing homes? Right? For a lot of people, we're prolonging suffering. There are some people who do not want to be around any longer, but the family members are like, we just don't want our loved one to go. It's selfish, and you're inflicting suffering on somebody who doesn't want to live any longer. Right? But we do that. Our, we uphold death, that, our, our life, I mean. Physical life has become our God. And that's replaced our Heavenly Father, our God. And so we so value life. Esther was young, by the way. She's a really young gal. And she says, you know what? If I perish, I perish. What's she saying? I'm going to go in there and I'm going to do this because this is what's right. God has called me to this. I'm the one in the position to do this. Do you think she liked me in that position? No. A lot of times, don't we have that language, though, as Christians? We're like, I just don't, I don't feel like I should have to do, right? Like, for such minor things, I don't feel like I should have to do that. I'm not being fulfilled, right? Don't we use that language? If I do this, if I serve God in this way, I don't feel like I'm going to be fulfilled in doing it. Do you know what God's answer is? So what? You see, our job as Christians is not to be fulfilled. It's not to be filled up. It's not to have our cups full. It's to serve people unto death. Jesus says, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must what? Deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. You've got to be willing to lay down your life for the sake of other people. Now, this isn't, Jesus isn't just like, you know, go out and, you know, run hog wild and hope for the best. Like, you ever drive with anybody who drives like that, by the way? <laughs> like, they get in the car and you're like, good night. And they're just like recklessly driving all over and they're like, or they're clueless. That's even worse, I think. You ever ride with anybody who runs over stuff and they don't even know? You're like, dude, you just hit a cat. What? <laughs> Jesus isn't talking about being reckless. He's talking about stepping in and you serve people unto death. When people are about to die and you're in the position, no matter how uncomfortable it makes you, even if it kills you, guess what you're called to do? To do it. Jesus isn't concerned. He's not concerned with your fulfillment. We've got to wipe that out as Christians. He's not concerned with you being spiritually filled up. He's concerned with you loving people, loving God, loving others, and serving Him. Doing what's right. Helping the oppressed. Helping the poor. You know, it's fascinating. This story goes on, by the way, the people were rescued. Uh, Mordecai went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Some of you ladies I know are loving this passage because she orders her, her cousin around, and, and he, he does it. <laughs> um, I kid, I kid. Uh, I'm going to skip forward a little bit, because as a result of the Jewish people being rescued, by the way, this woman is awesome. Can I get an amen to that? She is amazing. She's bold. She's courageous. And she says, if I perish, I perish. I'm marching in there, and I'm going to do what's right. And she did it. She fasted, she prayed, and she went in, she met the king, and the Jewish people were rescued. As a result of the Jews being rescued, a feast starts up that is still practiced by Jews to this day. It's called the Feast of Purim, and I want, I want to read this for a second. Skip to chapter 9. Uh, 
chapter 9. By the way, I want to back up just for a second to chapter 8, the very last verse, verse 17. I think it's just so awesome. And in the province and in every city, whether, uh, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. Isn't that cool? You almost miss it. If you're just reading through Esther, people are declaring themselves Jews who are non-Jews. They're not Jewish. These are Persian people, and they're declaring themselves Jews because they're like, man, whatever it is that you guys have, I want some of it. This God that you serve is incredible. This God is amazing. And we look around, and we see people celebrating, and you could have been bitter, and you could have been like, man, I can't believe that you know, our God. Do we, ever, do we ever do that to God, by the way? I can't believe, God, you would allow this to happen. The Jews didn't do that. What, did the, what was their response? Celebration, joy, happiness, but it didn't stop there. They initiate this Feast of Purim, which is still practiced today. I want to read the um, verses, starting in verse 20 of chapter 9. And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both far and, uh, near and far, obliging them... Uh, to keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and also the 15th day of the same year, by year by year, as the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make, uh, make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another, and listen to this, gifts to the poor. Isn't that cool? The celebration isn't about them. It's about helping other people. It's about giving gifts to, gifts to other people. It's about helping the poor, helping the oppressed. Isn't that cool? Isn't that a cool way to celebrate? By the way, today, um, let me explain to you a little bit about how this feast is celebrated. So the Jewish people fast for three days leading up to this feast. They fast and they pray for three days. There's a lot of shouting. There's a lot of laughing. There's a lot of joy. And then they come together and they start to eat together. And they just, they've been prepping this food for, for a couple of days. Then they come together and they have this big feast, this one big family. And they read the entire book of Esther publicly. And as they read it, they blot, and they're celebrating. This is joy, it's happiness, and they're celebrating that the Jews are alive today because of what Esther did. They're celebrating it. They're not just reading Scripture. They're not having a Bible study. They're living it out. They're celebrating it. And I love this. Every time they come to the name of Haman, they blot the name of the enemy out. And so they can do a combination of things. They can boo. They can hiss. They can stomp their feet, or they have these really annoying noisemakers. They can rattle these noisemakers. So every time the name Haman comes, yeah, there you go. Every time they hear Haman, it's boo, boo, and then they do these noisemakers. And then it's, it's this showing, this demonstration that, man, we stand with our sister Esther. She was bold. She was courageous. She stood up to the enemy. And God allowed us to prevail. It's awesome. I want to send you out uh, with encouragement and with this message. We talked about it in, in the adult class this morning. I believe the devil is very real. The devil is very active. And the devil is very crafty. He right now today is working on people's souls within the church, outside of the church. He doesn't discriminate and he's pulling people away. Some people by force. Some people, they don't need force. They just need apathy. He's pulling people away soul by soul by soul by soul. And the frightening thing, the church isn't resisting it. Because we're too self-absorbed. I want to celebrate with the with 
Esther and her crew and the Jewish people celebrate that God is faithful, God rescues his people, that God listens to the prayers of his people, and that God has master and power and dominion over the devil. That battle's already been won. I want us to go out this week, and I want us to be very intentional about opening it. And this is going to be scary, but open your eyes and look where the devil rules in people's lives. And I want you to intervene. I want you to step in, I want you to resist, and I want you to be an Esther to people. Because who knows, maybe you've been called for such a time as this. Be that person who boldly and courageously stands up and stands opposed to the devil and rescues people. There are people who are, who are dying from really horrible spiritual battles. Be that person. If there's anybody today who has not yet taken that step to put Christ on a baptism, we invite you to do that. Um, we will immerse you. You will bury your old self, be raised up a new person, clothed with Jesus Christ. You will have the gift of the Holy Spirit. If anybody has any prayer needs, we invite you to come forward, or you can go to the back. Our shepherds will be in the back as we stand and sing. Let's sing together.